Edisistus was a soft-bodied invertebrate that lived in shallow tropical coastal waters of muddy estuaries during the Pennsylvanian geological period. The classification is uncertain, the animal had a unique H-shaped body ranging from 2 to 11 cm long, and researchers have suggested a ambulacrarian affinity. An alternate opinion considers Edisistus to be a hydrozoan, provisionally in the Siphonophory. Her pedigaster had a slightly helical clockwise curling body with about 13 segments, and long paired tentacles on its head that branched in a fractal-like pattern. Its actual ecology isn't really known. It was probably a suspension feeder, extending its tentacles to catch plankton and organic particles in the water, but some specimens have been found in association with small hyalith shells, and in the Chinese species some of those shells are preserved inside its mouth and gut cavity suggesting a possible predatory mode of life instead. Aldonia had the same clockwise coiled gut and branching feeding tentacles, but lacked the attachment stalk and instead had a more flattened form with its sac-like body expanded and fused into a tough but flexible wide disc. Much like its relative its overall ecology is still uncertain. It may have tentacles waving up above itself, suspension feeding, but the fossils are almost always preserved the other way around with the tentacles facing downwards below the disc. Possibly it could extend its tentacles out beyond the disc and sweep them across the seafloor, feeding on whatever organic detritus or small prey it encountered. Discophyllum's disc would have been tough but flexible, containing numerous supporting radial structures that were probably part of a fluid-filled hydrostatic skeleton, giving it an almost radially symmetric body plan superficially resembling a jellyfish. The lifestyle of Eldoniids is still uncertain, but they seem to have mostly sat on the seafloor, possibly extending their tentacles out from under their discs to grab nearby food. Graptolites are colonial animals, each graptolite colony originates from an initial individual, called the sicular zooid, from which the subsequent zooids will develop. They are all interconnected by stolons, a true colonial system shared by Rhabdopleura but not Cephalodiscus. These zooids are housed within an organic structure comprising a series of tubes secreted by the glands on the cephalic shield. Graptolites were a major component of the early Paleozoic ecosystems, especially for the zooplankton because the most abundant and diverse species were planktonic. They were most likely suspension feeders and strained the water for food such as plankton. There are still many questions regarding graptolite locomotion but all these mechanisms are possible alternatives depending on the species and its habitat. Acorn worms have a circulatory system with a heart that also functions as a kidney. They have gill-like structures that they use for breathing, similar to the gills of primitive fish. Therefore, acorn worms are sometimes said to be a link between classical invertebrates and vertebrates. Some also have a postanal tail which may be homologous to the postanal tail of vertebrates. An interesting trait is that its three-section body plan is no longer present in the vertebrates, except for the anatomy of the frontal neural tube, later developed into a brain which is divided into three main parts. This means some of the original anatomy of the early chordate ancestors is still present even if it is not always visible. Acorn worms have a Y-shaped nuchal skeleton that starts their proboscis and collar on their ventral side. Cothernocystis was part of a group of bizarre marine animals called stylophorans. With their flattened bodies, single-segmented tail-like appendages, and complete lack of any type of true symmetry, stylophorans looked more like alien lifeforms than any sort of known animal group, but the structure of their calcite armor plates suggests they were actually part of the echinoderms. 
Some forms show evidence of pharyngeal slits, an ancestral trait to all deuterostomes that was lost in other echinoderms. Early echinoderms seem to have started off as flattened animals that sat on the seafloor filter feeding, and with this largely immobile way of life their bodies started to shift into asymmetry, no longer constrained by the locomotory advantages of being bilaterally symmetric. In fact, for these early sedentary filter feeders being radial was actually much more advantageous, able to distribute sense organs all around their bodies and grab food from any direction without having to reposition themselves, converging on the lifestyle of non-bilaterian cnidarian polyps. The evolutionary transition from bilateral to asymmetrical to pentaradial seems to have happened incredibly quickly during the Cambrian explosion, and all modern echinoderms probably evolved from a group called the Edrioasteroids, maintaining their new base body plan even when they later began taking up more mobile lifestyles again. Stylophorans are therefore reconstructed as true echinoderms of uncertain affiliations, without radial symmetry but with sterium and a water vascular system. The body was oriented with the arm as the anterior end of the animal, which lay on the substrate, food would have been captured by tube feet and moved down the arm to the mouth. Some genera may have also used the water vascular system for locomotion. Rather than swimming with a muscular postanal tail as in chordates, Mobile genera would have crawled, arm first, using a water vascular system, like starfish and sea cucumbers. Early echinoderms seem to have gone through an asymmetrical phase before starting to evolving their characteristic radial symmetry. The first truly radial forms had three-way symmetry, but soon a group called the Edrioasteroids upped that count to five. Edrioasteroids were mostly shaped like discs or domes, and were immobile filter feeders that lived permanently attached onto surfaces like the seafloor or the shells of other animals. Thresherodiscus was an unusual Edrioasteroid that lived in the shallow seas of what is now central Canada during the late Ordovician. Its arms split additional times at irregular intervals, creating a complex asymmetrical branching pattern across its upper surface. The tips of its arms protruded slightly over the rim of its body, and along with the erratic extra branching this may have been an adaptation to increase its food-gathering surface area. The Eocrinoidea are an extinct class of echinoderms that lived between the early Cambrian and late Silurian periods. They are the earliest known group of stalked, arm-bearing echinoderms, and were the most common echinoderms during the Cambrian. They were benthic suspension feeders, with five ambulacra on the upper surface, surrounding the mouth and extending into a number of narrow arms. Another group of early pentaradial echinoderms known as the blastozoans were characterized by erect feeding appendages called brachioles. But some blastozoans abandoned their five-way symmetry in favor of much stranger arrangements, sometimes having as few as two arms, and, in some cases, two mouths. Known from the same general area and time period as Thresherodiscus, Amygdalocystites was part of an Ordovician to early Silurian lineage known as paracrinoids, which attached their irregularly shaped bodies to the seafloor via a stem. It had just two asymmetric arms forming food grooves along its upper edge, each lined with numerous long brachioles along just one of their sides. It probably orientated itself so its body was facing down current, which would have created eddies that brought suspended food particles within easier reach of its brachioles. Crinoids are marine animals that make up the class Crinoidea. Crinoids that are attached to the sea bottom by a stalk in their juvenile form are commonly called sea lilies, while the unstalked forms, called feather stars. 
Adult are characterized by having the mouth located on the upper surface. This is surrounded by feeding arms, and is linked to a U-shaped gut, with the anus being located on the oral disc near the mouth. Although the basic echinoderm pattern of five-fold symmetry can be recognized, in most crinoids the five arms are subdivided into ten or more. These have feathery pinnules and are spread wide to gather planktonic particles from the water. At some stage in their lives, most crinoids have a stem used to attach themselves to the substrate, but many live attached only as juveniles and become free-swimming as adults. Echinoderms with mineralized skeletons entered the fossil record in the early Cambrian, and during the next 100 million years, the crinoids and blastoids were dominant. At that time, the Echinodermata included 20 taxa of class rank, only five of which survived the mass extinction events that followed. The long and varied geological history of the crinoids demonstrates how well the echinoderms had adapted to filter feeding. The crinoids underwent two periods of abrupt adaptive radiation, the first during the Ordovician, and the other during the early Triassic. This Triassic radiation resulted in forms possessing flexible arms becoming widespread, motility, predominantly a response to predation pressure, also became far more prevalent than sessility. His radiation occurred somewhat earlier than the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, possibly because it was mainly prompted by increases in benthic predation, specifically of echinoids. There then followed a selective mass extinction at the end of the Permian period, during which all blastoids and most crinoids became extinct. Crinoids are passive suspension feeders, filtering plankton and small particles of detritus from the sea water flowing past them with their feather-like arms. The arms are raised to form a fan shape which is held perpendicular to the current. Mobile crinoids move to perch on rocks, coral heads or other eminences to maximize their feeding opportunities. The food particles are caught by the primary tube feet, which are fully extended and held erect from the pinnules, forming a food trapping mesh, while the secondary and tertiary tube feet are involved in manipulating anything encountered. Some fossil crinoids, such as Siphocrinus, seem to have lived attached to floating driftwood and complete colonies are often found. Sometimes this driftwood would become waterlogged and sink to the bottom, taking the attached crinoids with it. The stem of Siphocrinus can be several meters long. Crinoid fossils, and in particular disarticulated crinoid columnals, can be so abundant that they at times serve as the primary supporting clasts in sedimentary rocks. Crinoids are not capable of clonal reproduction as are some starfish and brittle stars, but are capable of regenerating lost body parts. Arms torn off by predators or damaged by adverse environmental conditions can regrow, and even the visceral mass can regenerate over the course of a few weeks. This regeneration may be vital in surviving attacks by predatory fish. In appearance, the Japanese sea lily resembles a feather duster. It has a central mouth surrounded by a crown of many branched feeding arms. These are jointed and can coil up or unroll to expose the feathery pinnules on either side to the current. Each pinnule has several rows of tube feet and a central ambulacral groove that leads to a groove on the arm that continues down to the mouth. It is a filter feeder. It extends its arms towards the current, spreads its pinnules and gathers plankton and other particles floating past. These are transferred into the groove by its tube feet, wrapped in mucus and moved along the groove by the cilia that line it. Most modern crinoids, the feather stars, are free-moving and lack a stem as adults. In general, crinoids move to new locations by crawling, using the cirri as legs. Such a movement may be induced in relation to a change in current direction, the need to climb to an elevated perch to feed, or because of an agonistic behavior by an encountered individual. Crinoids can also swim. They do this by coordinated, 
repeated sequential movements of the arms in three groups. At first the direction of travel is upwards but soon becomes horizontal, traveling at about 7 cm per second with the oral surface in front. Blue sea cucumber is a large sea cucumber, growing to a length of about 40 cm they are gonochoric, and only have a single gonad. During spawning season, eggs and sperm are externally released into the surrounding water by female and male individuals, respectively, and are fertilized when they meet. The emperor shrimp is known to inhabit the surface of the blue sea cucumber in a commensal relationship, possibly feeding on ectoparasites or organic detritus on the surface of its skin. Black sea cucumber is an omnivore, sifting through the sediment with its tentacles and feeding on detritus and other organic matter. As a defense against predators, it emits a toxic red fluid when its skin is rubbed or damaged. When attacked, it does not eject cuvirian tubules in the way that some sea cucumbers do, but instead extrudes its internal organs through its anus. They engage in sediment bioturbation, a process which plays an important role in the health of coral reefs. Like most other sea cucumbers, snot sea cucumbers burrow themselves in sand or mud, and extracts nutrients with their tentacles. Their diet consists entirely of the substrates it consumes via digging into the sands and pushing substrate into its mouth with its anchors, leaving discarded trails of sand as waste behind. This species has the ability to regenerate parts of its body if certain sections are lost due to ecological or predatory circumstances. This process of regeneration is called morphalaxis, where any residual tissues of the sea cucumber are redifferentiated to produce a smaller, but complete, animal. The tentacles of snake sea cucumber surround the mouth and are used in surface feeding. They are about 2.5 cm long when extended and have a short stem and a feather-like blade with 30 to 40 pairs of pinnules. The outer surfaces of the tentacles have numerous bulges and are adhesive while the inner surfaces are smooth, with clusters of cilia on the proximal parts. The tentacles are in continuous motion, they flatten themselves against the substrate or seagrass leaf blades and collect food particles by adhesion, then bend inwards until the tips are in the mouth, where the food is scraped off by the buccal sphincter muscle. The whole process takes only a few seconds, and several tentacles can deliver their loads at the same time. In a study in the Greenland Sea, coldwater sea cucumber occurred on the lower slopes of the continental shelf at depths of about 2,700 meters the sea lily and the sea cucumber were the dominant species present perhaps because echinoderms can adopt various foraging strategies to suit the availability of food supplies. It was found that most of the megafauna was only found within a certain range of depths, the only exceptions to this being the sea. It can be a very abundant animal that sometimes presents 60 individuals per one square meter it is a deposit feeder and its abundance may reflect differences in the availability of food in the sediment. The sea pig has a plump, rounded body and is typically pinkish or purplish in color. It has a soft and flexible body with numerous tube feet underneath. These sea cucumbers are deposit feeders, consuming detritus, organic particles and marine snow that settle on the seafloor. It is found in the abyssal plains of the deep ocean, often at depths ranging from 1000 to 1500 meters it has modified tube feet that help it crawl on the soft sediments of the ocean floor. These tube feet, along with its plump appearance, give it the nickname Sea Pig. It plays an essential role in the deep sea ecosystem by assisting in the breakdown of organic matter and recycling nutrients. Jellyfish sea cucumber is somewhat unusual in appearance in comparison with other sea cucumbers, as it looks more like a jellyfish with its large umbrella-like swimming structure supported by a ring of around 12 highly modified oral tentacles, its small tapered body and its swimming position with the mouth on top. 
This species constitutes the only true pelagic holothurian, and even echinoderm, known to date. However, its swimming seems mostly passive, more like slightly controlled drifting. Spanish dancers or headless chicken monsters move using a few methods. The first is that they move their anterior veil in a rowing motion. The second is that when there is a current, the organism will use their tentacles to pull themselves down current. They also move using a pushing motion with their tentacles. They feed mostly on benthic sediment by pushing food into their mouths with their tentacles. They feed very quickly, staying on the seafloor for at most 64 seconds. Since that is most enough time to feed fully, they feed episodically. When its development is contrasted to the Sideroid sister subclass Eueconoidea, the slate pencil urchin becomes a very interesting organism from the standpoint of developmental and evolutionary biology. In Eueconoid embryonic development, the micromeres comprise a set of four small cells that reside at the base of the vegetal plate. They are a precociously invaginating lineage, meaning that they move into the blastocele just prior to gastrulation these four cells then eventually give rise to the larval skeleton. The number and size of its micromeres can vary, and they do not precociously invaginate, rather, they ingress during gastrulation and bud off from the tip of the growing archenteron. More generally, sea urchins are spiny, globular echinoderms. About 950 species are distributed on the seabed of every ocean and inhabit every depth zone from the intertidal seashore down to 5,000 meters the spherical, hard shells of sea urchins are round and covered in spines. They move slowly, crawling with tube feet, and also propel themselves with their spines. Although algae are the primary diet, sea urchins also eat slow-moving animals. Like other venomous sea urchins, the venom of long-spined urchin is only mild and not at all fatal to humans. The toxin mostly causes swelling and pain, and gradually diffuses over several hours. More danger is presented by the delivery system, the urchin spines which are extremely brittle and needle-like. They easily break off within flesh and are quite a challenge to extract. It has been observed to be able to avoid danger by rapidly inverting its body and running on the tips of its longest spines. This behavior is triggered by sudden impacts and the snapping of one or more of its spines. The internal organs of sea urchins are enclosed in a hard shell or test composed of fused plates of calcium carbonate covered by a thin dermis and epidermis. The test is referred to as an endoskeleton rather than exoskeleton even though it encloses almost all of the urchin. This is because it is covered with a thin layer of muscle and skin. Sea urchins also do not need to molt the way invertebrates with true exoskeletons do, instead the plates forming the test grow as the animal does. Heart urchin's body is a somewhat elongated oval in form, and is distinguished by the mouth being placed towards one end of the animal, and the anus towards the other. As a result, heart urchins, unlike most other sea urchins, are bilaterally symmetrical, and have a distinct anterior surface. The presence and position of the mouth and anus typically give members of this group the distinct heart shape from which they get their name. Sea urchins move by walking, using their many flexible tube feet in a way similar to that of starfish, regular sea urchins do not have any favorite walking direction. The tube feet protrude through pairs of pores in the test, and are operated by a water vascular system, this works through hydraulic pressure, allowing the sea urchin to pump water into and out of the tube feet. During locomotion, the tube feet are assisted by the spines which can be used for pushing the body along or to lift the test off the substrate. 
Sea urchins possess a hemal system with a complex network of vessels in the mesenteries around the gut, but little is known of the functioning of this system. However, the main circulatory fluid fills the general body cavity, or coelom. This coelomic fluid contains phagocytic coelomocytes, which move through the vascular and hemal systems and are involved in internal transport and gas exchange. The coelomocytes are an essential part of blood clotting, but also collect waste products and actively remove them from the body through the gills and tube feet. Sea urchins are one of the favorite foods of many lobsters, crabs, triggerfish, California sheephead, sea otter, and wolf eels. All these animals carry particular adaptations and a strength that allow them to overcome the excellent protective features of sea urchins. Left unchecked by predators, urchins devastate their environments, creating what biologists call an urchin barren, devoid of macroalgae and associated fauna. Sea urchins graze on the lower stems of kelp, causing the kelp to drift away and die. Loss of the habitat and nutrients provided by kelp forests leads to profound cascade effects on the marine ecosystem. The green sea urchin is often found with pieces of algae, bits of seagrass and fragments of mollusk shell on its aboral surface, holding them in place with its tube feet. It is thought that the urchin is photosensitive and that these pieces of debris may provide some protection from strong sunlight and ultraviolet light in the clear shallow waters it favors. It is sometimes found in aggregations of closely packed individuals. This may be linked to breeding activities but at other times it has no known cause. <laughs>